so I'm going to talk about taking the pain out of web development. Um, so I was reading this book called Influencer, Power to Change Anything. Anybody ever read that book before? Okay, cool. It's a really great book. Um, but there, there was a couple core principles, and I mentioned them in like the description of this, but then I didn't even, I don't even remember exactly what all they were. But uh, I think it was that you want to make the invisible visible. If you want to change something, you have to take the invisible part that makes it difficult to change, and you have to make that visible. So either people know why they want it to change, or how to change it, it's got to become easier to change if you want it to change. So you have to make the invisible visible and then people have to have faith that whatever needs done can be done because if you don't, if you don't, uh, can I do it, is it worth it? Or the, the other, I think, two, two principles. Like, can I do web development? Yeah, how hard is it going to be? I don't know. Is it worth it? Well, maybe. That depends on how hard it's going to be. If I don't believe I can do it, I'm not going to start. And if I don't believe it's going to be worth it, then I'm not going to start, or at least I'm not going to finish. Um, so what I want to talk about is how to, to overcome that process of making the invisible visible and then making it, making it believable that it, it can be done and it's worth it. So... I want to talk about tools that make the invisible visible. One of the great problems with web development is that you don't really see errors. You don't see errors in your CSS, you don't see errors in your JavaScript, sometimes. You don't see errors in HTML, ever. You might experience the error but you don't see it. There's not something clear in the browser that says, hey, there's an error here. Some of those tools are becoming more developed, but by and large, it's increasing the cycle. It's increasing, like, how much time does it take me to do X? Well, it takes me a long time because I have to do X, and then I have to verify that X worked, and then I don't know why X didn't work, and then I have to change things. And at least in a programming language like uh, JavaScript, you can, you can console.log. I mean, if you're not good at testing and you're not good at... Um, uh, knowing exactly what causes a problem. You can console.log on line 12 and then console.log again on line 14 and console.log again on line 16 and, and do that whole binary search of, you know, by going through the program and console.logging values, then I can determine where the value went wrong or where what was supposed to happen didn't happen. Um, with CSS and HTML, you have no such good fortune. It's just either it worked or it didn't. And uh, if you're lucky, then your browser may give you some sort of warning uh, that there was a syntax error or something, but it, it may not be clear, or it may just say ignored attribute, whatever. So less is a tool that is actually, whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. That's okay. Um, it's a node tool. Let me bring up the website here that helps with CSS. And I want to start with this one, not because I think it's most important, but because I think it's absolutely easiest in terms of changing your workflow to be something different from what it is now. Uh, using less has the least amount of impact on what you're already doing with your, your CSS, the least amount of change. So let me try this one more time. And less Googles are not less workings. Um, let me see if I've got an Ethernet cable. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just try to use the, the Ethernet cable here. Yeah. Uh, I got it. I got it. Yeah. I was just having a hard time finding it. There we are. So, and also, that's odd. I'm at 9% battery and my charger isn't turning on. Not good. All right, let's see. Ba boom. Okay, cool. So there's a couple other tools like this um, that, and most people approach it from the angle of like, oh, you can do more with 
less, or you can do more with SAS, or you can do more with stylus. And the approach that I'm coming at this with is you can do less with less, or SAS or stylus. Um, I'm not sure exactly how, how all of them work, but I know that this one is 100% one-to-one correspondence with CSS. So if all you do is rename your .css file to .less, and you run the compile step, it will syntax check it, and it will put out a CSS file that is valid. So it's, there may be a few errors with the parser here and there in terms of, um, I, I haven't experienced any with less that, I, that I'm aware of, but, but there may be one here or there where, not that if you write good code it comes out bad, but if you write bad code it might not catch it. Um, like I said, I haven't experienced that, but, but with these tools in general, I found that that's sometimes the case there. You know, you could put an escape character of some sort that somehow it goes weird. But um, if you have Node installed, and Node is super easy to install. Has anybody installed Node before? Okay. Is it, was it a difficult experience at all? I've seen people are shaking their head this way. And did you have a comment question? Would this help you out? Um, uh, no, but thank you. Okay. I, I jiggled the power cord and, and now it's telling me that it, it is charging, so thanks though. I, I dropped my MacBook the other day and it bent the corner and that's where the power thing is and I think it's like sometimes just this much off now. Ugh, terribleness. Anyway, so you can, once you have Node installed, and, and I'll just show you, most of these these tools are node-based because that's what I like to use and it kind of makes sense to have web development tools uh, that are based on node because node is JavaScript and so since you're learning JavaScript anyway if you find that you have to tweak the tool somehow or you want to implement it um, that use the API of the tool and that makes it easier um, but it, the Windows installer the Macintosh installer are simple double clicks and then the Linux binaries do work with Ubuntu, so you can tar xvf c slash user slash local, and um, and that that'll pretty much work. Actually, I think you have to do dash dash step equals one also to get rid of the nodes directory itself. But anyway, um, so all three of these are really painless installers. So you can install Node, and then you just do um, npm install dash g less or depending on your setup you may need to do sudo depending on whether or not user local is owned by your local user I've already done that but I just want to make a really simple CSS file so I'll just make a directory for uh, painless demo and it, can people see this okay should I make it even bigger that may be better and I'm gonna I'm gonna use vim um, just because that's, that's how I roll. I'm a Vimster. And main dot c, uh, less. And let's see, I'll do color red and background color blue. Oops, and type visual to get out of EX mode. Cool, so now if I run less c on main.less and I direct that output to main.css, then I open up main.css and I see that it actually changed things. Um, let me run that without redirecting it. Hmm, I'm actually surprised that it did that. So what it did, I intentionally made an error here where I left out the semicolon. And I'm guessing that in the latest version of less, perhaps the semicolons are optional. You know, there's been a lot of talk about that lately. But anyway, it output valid CSS. And if I were to make an error that wasn't an optional part of less syntax, because less is a superset of CSS, then it would give me it would give me an error. So let me do something like width, and then not give it a value, and then run this again. 
Boom. Parse error, syntax error on line four. So I like this because it's making the invisible visible. How many times have, is anybody in here a designer? Okay, about one and a half, two, two and a half. All right. Um, so how many have worked with a designer before? Okay, and how many have had a style not apply correctly because the designer forgot a semicolon or did something like camel case the name when it was supposed to be all lowercase or something like that? Just one? Nobody? Okay, so everybody that has worked with a designer then it looks like. Good. Um, so obviously this is not going to fix the problem of the camel case issue, but it will catch those issues where uh, either you or the designer has made some sort of syntax error that's very minute and very difficult to tell and where the browser might just gloss over it and things might look mostly right because maybe the default width of the item is going to be 700 pixels and you're telling it, well, actually add some padding and make it 710 pixels and you don't really notice that it didn't come out quite right and so things go on and then later on you try to reapply the width and then you find out that you can't and it's because the section that's just below that last section never gets read because there was a parse error there and it didn't continue to parse into the next section and then you're like, why, why, why? Um, so the other, the other thing here is this is, this is maybe kind of annoying because you're used to just writing a CSS file and then when you're done writing that file, you're done and you don't have to do a compile step and so adding a compile step to your process is kind of annoying and it kind of makes it more difficult which makes you less likely to change the way that you're doing things even though you might believe that you can do this and it certainly would save you time in the long run it's not really convenient and so I'll get into, I'll talk a little bit about grunt later which makes it convenient but just in terms of being able to get these kind of errors uh, is anybody already using a CSS syntax checker in their editor? We got one person using a CSS syntax checker in their editor. Okay, two, two. No, that was the same person in their hand twice. <laughs> All right, good, good. Um, so, what I'd like to introduce you to is Sublime Text Two, and also Syntastic depending on whether you swing towards Vim or Sublime Text 2, because I know none of you use Emacs, that's just ridiculous. <laughs> uh, but it, seriously, there's, there's plugins for you know, Emacs and, and a lot of the popular text editors, but it seems to me that most people that are doing web development in the community that I've worked with, most people are either using Sublime Text 2 or they're using Vim, or if they're just a little bit behind the curve, they're still using TextMate. Um, and Sublime Text 2 just kind of replaces TextMate because it took them years and years and years to come out with TextMate 2 and people were just like, well, we need more features now. And so they built Sublime Text 2 which can import all of your TextMate plugins. Um, and it also has a range of its own. And then Syntastic uh, gets installed with, with Pathogen and Vim. Um, both of... Uh, so Syntastic is not equivalent to Sublime Text 2. Vim is equivalent to Sublime Text 2, but there is Sublime Linter. And maybe I'll be so gracious as to actually demo installing a plugin a little bit later. But it's basically you, you hold down like Control P Shift something and it pops up with a window and then you type in package and it shows you a list and it's got package manager in there and you click on that and then you type in a name of modules like less and then it comes up with one um, and Sublime Linter already includes a bunch of them in there. Oh this one doesn't actually include uh, less it includes JS hint though which is another thing I'm going to talk about in just a minute. Well there's, a, there's another plugin for Sublime Text 2 that will handle um, less but even, even if you didn't want to use less uh, I, the thing I like about less is then you can progressively enhance because it does allow you to do things like variables let me go back to their page real quick um, so you can do something like at base color and then you can use somewhere else 
and, and this, this is kind of a complicated example. I mean, you don't need to start out with using all the features of less, but you can just use like one or two at a time as it becomes convenient. As you hit a pain point where you're like, uh, oh, this is annoying to do in CSS, then you can go look it up and say, well, how do you do this in less? And you find out it's much simpler. Like having a base color is kind of nice because then if you decide you want to change everything that uses one of your, you know, maybe you have five colors on your website and you decide that you want everything that was this shade of blue to actually be a slightly different shade of blue, you go in, you change the, uh, the variable, and then now you have all of those things the right shade of blue. Uh, another thing that I like about less right from the get-go, um, I mean, the, the, I think the two things that somebody would be interested in if you don't want to learn something else to use it would be just that you can have variables in less and you can have um, imports that work a lot like PHP includes or any other template language includes. Where did it go with the example? Importing, yeah. And so then you get uh, your output file when you use something like this. If you do an import of a less file, um, it will actually include it into your your file and then the output main.css will have the three files in it instead of you having to do three separate link tags in your HTML. Will it mark the different files so that you can scan it and know which who's the offending file? Um well in terms of when 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 it parses, yes. When it parses it it will do that. So I'll just give a quick example. Use SAS and Yeah, so in terms of the, in the web browser, uh, I don't believe that it does that. Maybe there's an option for it. I haven't been using it. My main concern with it is the parse step. Like I just, when, I, when I'm catching those errors before they get into the, you know, where I'm hitting refresh to figure out what's going wrong, that's where it eases my pain the most. Um, perhaps SAS has the, oh, I forget what it's called, source map. Is that, is that what you're talking about? Okay. All right, so let me just do this real quick. At import bad dot less and then less c main dot less. So there you can see that it, it is reading in the import and it's checking its syntax and it finds that it's bad. And then if I output it, you can see that it actually includes the import. And if I'm not mistaken, let me go ahead and try this. I don't want to throw too much at you because I just kind of wanted to show that it, it's cool and it eases pain. But I believe you can do stuff like this where you actually import uh, you can do nesting. Can you carry a comment through? Uh, let's let's see about that. Let me put the comment in here. I think it has two different comment styles: one that may carry through, and the other that doesn't. So I'll just try both real quick and see. Yeah. So if you use the regular CSS. CSS syntax for comments, it carries through. If you use the um, double slash, then it will not carry through. And just so you know, double slash is not something you're actually allowed to use in CSS. It may work for you, but it's not allowed by the standard. So next thing that I want to introduce you to um, in a very similar fashion to what Les is doing, but actually maybe even doing less than Les, is JS Hint. How many have heard of JS Hint? How many currently use it? Okay, that makes me sad. Um, How many will use it tomorrow? Uh, yeah, so, so th this, this eases a lot of pain, it really does. Uh, I'm gonna show you a trick about JS Hint that I did not know for like the first year I was using it. You can create a .jshintrc file in your home directory 
I don't know how that works in Windows, but um, in, in Mac and Linux, it's just your normal home directory. And you can tell it what options that you want. Like, I just say this, for any, any JS file I'm ever working on, if I don't have comments in the file specifying otherwise, or I don't have a JS hint file in the project, you can actually put your JS hint RC in any project directory, and then JS hint will use that as, as what kind of errors it's supposed to catch. Um, but for any JavaScript file I'm ever working on, unless I specify differently, I always want JS hint to turn these options on or off. And, and Syntastic, for Vim, automatically recognizes if you have JS hint installed. Uh, it doesn't say it here on the page, but it does. Oh, it's probably under plugin or something. Or somewhere. Wherever it is. Oh, syntax checkers, right there. Yeah. So it has both JS lint and JS hint. Most people are using JS hint now because it is a little bit more configurable. Um, it provides pretty much all the same safety that JS lint does. But now, if I open up a JavaScript file, <coughs> um, so just whatevs.js and I start writing some bad code I would consider this to be bad code and now it's going to tell me there's an error and it says that I am missing you strict and that I um, have defined the function say, but I never use it in any way. It's not being exported, it's not being uh, called, it's just dead code. So some people don't like that dead code option because it is annoying when you're just doing more debugging type stuff and you want to have a function that you're using and swap between two. Um, so that, that, that is not always useful. And let me just show you which option that is where I've got it turned on. It is unused is the name of the option. All of the options for JS hint are documented on the JS hint site right under docs. There's a nice long list. Um, let me get down to where that section actually is. Okay, so enforcing options. These are all things that you can optionally turn on. It'll say in the comments whether or not it's on by default. Most of them are true false. Some of them have options. Um, the strict mode is about to have a new option. Um, so the strict mode, for those of you that, that don't know, is just ES5 JavaScript at its fullest. If you're not using strict mode, then you're using ES5 JavaScript in the old ES3 mode. So you get a few of the features of ES5, but you don't get all of them. When you use strict mode, you're opting in to get all of the features of ES5, and a lot of those features are simply things that um, turn unseen or silent errors into thrown errors. So if you've got some code you've never tested before and you just throw use strict up at the top, there's a good chance it'll let you know about errors that you have in your code. Um, if you're starting writing code, there's no disadvantage to adding use strict. Browsers that don't understand it simply ignore it. Browsers that do understand it enforce it. Um, and uh, actually, Chrome runs all of your code in strict mode by default so that it can run it faster and then will optionally run your code in ES3 mode if it fails to validate strict mode. And so it's just running it in the slower mode. But anyway, so there's, there's enforcing options and relaxing options and they have all the nice things here about automatic semicolon insertion, uh, allowing to use comma first or, or not. It's kind of style checker and quality checker as well. Yeah? I want to ask you a quick, quick question about use strict. Um, what is the scope of use strict? Is it file scope? Does it have any special type of scope? Oh, yeah, so I was about to get to that. Um, so now that the more popular libraries and plugins are, are allowing you to to use strict when you concat all your code together. 
the, the new option that's coming out in JS Hint will allow an implicit strict where you don't actually have to type use strict at the top of your file, um, but it will assume that when your code gets concatenated that it is going to have use strict. Uh, the safe way to do it for any module, if you don't mind adding the extra 20 characters or so, is you take one of these what we call ifies, immediately invoked function expression. Um, and you just wrap your entire file in this. And then that file is safe to include in, in your, um, it's safe to concatenate and it's safe to include on any of your apps. However, if you don't do the ify and you just have it like this, it's no longer safe to concatenate because the scope is to the function scope unless it's at the top of the file. If it's not either in function scope, meaning the first expression in the function, or the first line in the file, it's simply ignored and thrown away as a, an illogical string that you express but never do anything with. So if for whatever, if for some particular reason I don't want to wrap it in the iffy, am I still safe if I put it at the very top? as long as you're not concatenating. So I, I would say the, the best thing to do is to use JS hint. Um, I don't know if the, the implied strict mode just landed or not. I think, that, I think that presently, let me just try something real quick to see how the current option works. I think presently there's an option called global strict that sounds like what it does is allows you, because by default it's going to say you can't put use strict at the top of a file because there's a concatenation error if you do that. Um, so global strict does two things as far as I understand it. It allows you to put it at the top of the file and it assumes whether or not you put use strict in your code that when it gets concatenated that it will be in use strict mode. So it gives you all of the, the, um, the lint checker safety of having uh, put that in there. So let me just try something stupid. No, nope. it's still not doing that. So, so the, the upshot of it is wrap it in if you don't. Yeah, that's that's the simplest way to do it. Um, and 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 then once they change the option in JS Hint, and they, I probably should just install the latest JS Hint and try again to see if it um, it works or not and then see if they've got it in here. Okay, strict. Strict mode is an opt-in, blah, 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 blah. Okay, no, they still have it as a true false. So they haven't updated the documentation at least, and I don't think the code has been updated yet either. Anyway. Um, and it didn't like that. So in uh, Sublime, Sublime Linter, when you install that plugin into Sublime, it does have JS hints or JS lint that it automatically uses, and it does the same kind of thing as Vim does, where it gives you an indicator. This is what line the error is on, and then this is what the error is. So those are um, just great, great tools to be using because. Again, it, it's making the invisible visible. It's letting you know right away when you have an error in your JavaScript instead of having to wait to run to know if there's an error in your JavaScript. And then I, I guess some people are using like IntelliJ or, or some larger editor framework that has more tools installed and so maybe you're already getting that benefit. Um, and then of course you can also run JS hints directly on, on a file. and then get the output from it, but that's not as useful as having it built right into your editor. Uh, and then the last of the, the big three, CSS, JavaScript, and HTML, I want to show is Jade. <coughs> Jade has a little bit of a learning curve to it. Generally, when I introduce people to Jade, uh, their response for the first two hours is, this sucks, why would I ever use this? This doesn't make any sense to me. Most of those people are designers that I'm introducing it to. Um, oops. 
And then usually at the end of the next day, they get back to me and they say, oh my goodness, how was I ever doing anything without this? So this gives you an idea of what Jade does. It is a, a one-to-one -one correspondence between um, Jade and HTML. However, the syntax is not the same. Valid HTML is not valid Jade. But valid Jade will always produce valid HTML, with the exception that uh, Jade's parser is not as strict as um, the, the less parser. And so I have seen occasions where uh, there is incorrect syntax in Jade and then it goes on to produce incorrect syntax in HTML. But with the stipulation that you have correct syntax in Jade, you will have correct syntax in HTML. Um, I'm sure that everybody at some point has run into the issue where you open a div up here, you get your indentation wrong somewhere along the lines, and then you close the div somewhere else, either too soon or too late, and then it results in your page looking kind of wonky, and it's kind of difficult to figure out, like, where did that wonkiness come from? Anybody have that problem? Okay, so at least half of you. And that's why I like using Jade. There's, again, um, my approach for this is way different than most people that you'll hear talk about it, because they're going to tell you about the features. They're going to be, oh yeah, you, will, you can use this for templating, and, and it has this, and this, and that, and even this. Throw it on the ground. That's what I say. Just use it for the simple stuff. I mean, let, let yourself get into it for the, the simple fact that it will produce valid HTML for you and make your life easier. Then when you want to get fancy, when you want to create like um, a... It, it's kind of like Jade is, is really the equivalent of PHP uh, 3.0. When, when PHP was just a template language and, and they weren't tacking on all those programming language features. Um, that's that's what, what Jade is. It's, it's built in Node, um, but it's just, it's a, it's, it's a template language and a template syntax, and if you're not using any of the advanced features, then it is just a template. Um, so... In that example, how did the if statement get its value? Uh, where are we looking at? You are using Jade. How, how does that define so that it actually branches and produces different output? Left-hand side, almost all the way down. Yeah. Oh. So the, the way that works is when you're, when you're using, um, I'm not sure how it works. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure exactly how it works when you're using uh, Jade the way that I normally use it, because I'm normally not using the variables. I use, it, I use the command line tool and, and the, uh, the, the, the build step of it. I've also used the API before. The API, which is Node, you can pass in an object where every object that's, uh, or every key in that object is then referenced in the Jade. And so you can put an if statement, and if that object has a value, then it will do something. And you can for each over an array. So um, I, I created a little blogging system. Let me see if I can actually pull it up. Uh, when I was working at Spot RRF, we, we basically. Yeah, it's just it's just JSON, straight JavaScript. Yeah, let's see. It's not buildoc.com. It's milson.org. Let me see. Okay, so we made this with um, actually both Jade and Markdown, and this is where I actually used the API of it. And we just had everything go into uh, a single page. Let me see if there's the other bit here. But we, yeah, we we had a bunch of different Jade files, and then we just iterated over directory and then pulled them all into a single uh, Jade file so that we could have a single page documentation that's kind of in the style of what you're seeing nowadays. And uh, if you're interested in making some documentation that's like this, this is definitely not the best documentation generator. But it's called Mildoc, and it's on GitHub, just as a side note. Um, and yeah, it uses Jade and Markdown for creating stuff. So I'll go ahead and view the documentation here, and then just run a quick demo. Internet problems galore. So.
So you can just do bang, 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 five. I don't know why they chose that. You can also do, I think, doc type five. But that just puts the HTML5 header in there. And then you can open your HTML, open your body, uh, open your head, put in your title. Actually, I don't want this to be my title. Uh, a couple things that aren't intuitively obvious, because for the most part, this is this is pretty obvious what, what's going on. Um, every time you use a valid HTML tag or something that isn't a special part of Jade syntax, because if you use blah, like if I just create blah, it'll go ahead and it might uh, not syntax highlight it for me, but it will let me know that um, it, it'll create a blah element. And if you're using Angular or something like that where you're doing custom elements, any of those frameworks where you're making up new stuff. So you can do that, no problem. And, and generally, you can put the, the element and then you can put a text node. Um, or if you have a large block of text, you, there, there's two ways that, that it can be done. Um, one way that I'm not particularly a fan of is you can do this. And the other way is that you can end it with a period. You can do a period right after your uh, your element declaration, and both of these are valid ways for doing blocks of text. And oh, one thing that I failed to mention the the, the thing that I love about Jade so much is that it is almost exactly using CSS selectors to create your elements. So you don't have to worry about class equals and this equals and that equals. You know, just do. So say I want this P class to be, I want it to have the ID of main, and then it's going to have a, a para class, and it'll also have a um, awesome class, and then it'll have um, instead of instead of I don't know why they did this. This is like the one break they did from the CSS syntax, but instead of using brackets like you would in CSS, it's actually parens, and so then I can put something like data adder thing equals foobar comma um, I guess it would make more sense if I show this with an image like src equals path to image dot ping and uh, alt equals some title of image. Oops. And that right there is is 90% of what I use for Jade. Um, I love it because it it's just really clean. I always know what level I'm working at. It will complain if the spaces are off. Um, and then I can just very cleanly, and, you, and you, there's also an HTML to Jade module where you can run HTML to Jade, and if it's valid HTML, it will produce a valid Jade file. If it is not valid HTML, it'll barf, and if you haven't been testing your HTML for validity, you probably have like an extra end tag or something in there in a weird place that would mess it up. Just out of curiosity, I, did, I, I just want to see something. What's up? Just type in a real simple table of Jade real quick. I want to see something. Okay. Just create a table, a simple table, a stupid little table. Sure. So uh, I do table, and then um, was it T A T R then T H T H. Is it T H? It should be T H. T H T H. That's like T I. Oh, and then there's supposed to be uh, T body. T body. And then I have T R and then T D. Yeah. Yeah. And then you don't put the T, so you don't have to put the in tag. J basically take just, okay, that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. Is so the white space, is the white space significant, significant, significant then? Yeah. yeah, the white space is significant. That is how it knows whether something is in or out. Yeah. So you just get a, a very clear visual representation of 
Am I inside this node or am I outside of this node? Well, all you got to do is look at it. You don't have to keep track of all your closing tags. You don't have to worry about the mistake of not closing a tag. And then when you output it, um, it outputs to minified HTML, which shouldn't be a problem for debugging because when you open it up in your debugger, it's going to make it pretty for you anyway. You know, if I open this up in Chrome. So you got a token for that blog. And yeah. Where, where would you just, just cut and paste? You, you couldn't just copy and paste that whole thing. Where, where would you pull that from? I could, what, what do you mean? Where would I pull what? Uh, you configure where it writes to. Yeah, yeah. Suppose I want to take that and put it to my Eclipse editor or something. I, I had an idea for a table. I use Jade. I type it in. It spits that out. Where did I just get that? So I could just cut and paste it. Let me just man Jade real quick. Okay, let me just jade-help real quick. I'm pretty sure there's a debug option. Oh, dash, dash P. Yeah. Oh, print. Oh, P for pussy. That's good. Yeah, so if you don't want to do a uh, minified output, yeah. you do jade-p. Yeah. And, um, and then it then it hangs forever. Let me... Maybe it was confused. Um, maybe I didn't read the documentation correctly. Oh, maybe it was capital P and I put lowercase p. But yeah, so now it's prettified. So by default, everything is interpreted as a tag unless it is part of Jade syntax, like the if or something. So I put this blah here. Um, and that's just going to be interpreted as a tag. So the one thing that I sometimes make a mistake on is I forget to put the dot at the end and then I start doing text. Or I do put the dot at the end and then I start doing like another p tag or something inside of it, but that's pretty easy to catch. So I mean that's Well, so there's no such thing as a empty text node. Like you always have to have text contained in, in something. So the, the answer to your question would be do span dot. And by default, this is something I didn't mention, um, everything is a div by default. So if I just start putting a class name or an ID name, those are going to be divs by default. I don't have to do div, div. It just assumes that everything's div by default. So if you just want plain text, you do span period, and then you just keep all of your text um, inside of that. How do you close the period? How does it know? You, you just go, you just go back. Yeah, you just outdent. That's it. And so, let me see, is there anything else that I want to tell you about Jade? I think I, I, think I just want to try to introduce Grunt to you real quick. And I'm probably just going to go to a project that I already have Grunt in instead of building it from scratch just because of time. Can I, can I ask one? So, so Jip, do you have to memorize all of your tag elements or does like Jade have anything like a code can like if you want to create a select to select drop down with multiple options, would would does Jade have the ability oh I have a select then so need an option then. Jade in itself, no. But if you're using Sublime Text, yeah. Um, I would not be surprised if the Sublime Text plugin for Jade yeah. does that because I've noticed other plugins for Sublime Text do that. And I also have seen plugins for Vim that can do that, but I yeah. have not a big deal, been too I'm lazy to learn it. Because sometimes at work when I'm doing something, I want to have a component and I have to go into like, do, hey, well, how, you know, what was the method for this? And I have to go and Google it. I mean, if they have something, you know, any time I can have something in IntelliSense and for my, like you say, you know, it's going to make things simpler. So I'm happy to add. All right. Well, so let, let me just do one more thing with, uh, with Jade and then I'll, I'll go on to Grunt for the last couple minutes. I, I did want to show you the other thing that I use a lot, which is includes. So let's say this uh, big main is a component that I just, for whatever reason, decide that I don't want to um, component.jade. So I can do an include and then I can put, so I, I, now I'm separate, whoops, I'm separating out, I have to re-indent this back to where it needs to be, but I'm separating out components 
of my HTML into separate pieces. Now, when I run Jade on this, uh, it's it's still going to produce a single. Oh. Component. Yep. If I could spell correctly. Uh, so, it, uh, what did I do now? Oh, maybe no quotes. Okay, there it is. So I still have that in there. And you can also do reverse includes, like where it will include everything above and below. It's called yield. But, but so if you, if you wanted to do a reverse include where in every single page you were including the header and footer, you would actually use yield instead. You would yield the one thing to the other and then it would get placed in there. Uh, and then of course, well not of course, but you can also do just straight up HTML. So if you have a little HTML snippet that you want to have as a component, you don't care to convert it to Jade, you can just do like that. So that's, that's Jade, and then I will show Grunt real quick. Let's see if I've got a project in this home directory that is using it. Uh, maybe, oops, I've got it in my other folder for sure. And grunt is the part that makes all of this even less painful because it will handle uh, all that, that generation stuff. So running the less every time, running the jade every time, running the JS hint every time. And so that's why I like grunt. Oh, is this the wrong one? And I, I do have uh, both for JS hints, oops, and Grunt. Um, I have YouTube videos that explain how to get things set up. So if you Google Cool Age 86 and Grunt, you'll see me explaining this step by step. And that's actually thanks to Merrick. How many of you guys know Merrick? Works at Domo. He's a really cool guy. He's the one that turned me on to Grunt, um, showed me how to use it. So let me see if I can just pull that up before we end here. But basically with grunt, you have a grunt file.js. So it's, you can think of it, it's similar to a make process. And then you pass in, you, you do this module.exports equals function and that grunt gets passed into that. And then every single module that you're using has a configuration. The configuration is kind of arbitrary to that module. There are certain standards that persist across modules because the grunt team has said, like if you're using files, then call the name of that key files and it will, and, and so most people adhere to those, those standards. So there's some, some similarities, uh, but it's not, it's not necessarily required. The, the watch module, I, I don't recommend using that. There's actually, this is what I was using, but there's a better one called regard with an E at the end. And what both watch and regard do, but regard does better and has a couple of other plugins, is they let you, so every time you save the file, it just reruns the thing that will output your HTML and your CSS. Regard has a plugin called Live Load or Live Reload, so that it will actually put a little bit of JavaScript into your HTML so that every time you hit save, it will cause uh, a location.reload in the browser, so you don't even have to hit the refresh button. So um, this is what my grunt file for this project looks like. I've got my less configuration I've got my Jade configuration, and I use Pack Manager for doing my JavaScript concatenation. That's a tool that, that I wrote. It also can concatenate node files. And it, well, it, it works on the premise that you're using uh, common JS require and packages up everything that way. Um, so that's something you can look into if you want. I don't have a tutorial on it yet, but less in Jade. You can find out that information pretty easy. Um, and then Uglify is just a minifier for JavaScript. 
So each of those modules has that configuration that says in what mode which files I want to compile. And then you just go down here and you say load npm task and you load the module. All the ones that have contrib in them are official modules. So anything that is grunt contrib is a module that's been released by the grunt core team. And anything that does not is a module that's a, uh, a community module not released by the core team. Okay. And after you load the modules, you register a task. A task can be something like build or development or it can be any arbitrary name. And then you tell it which module and which configuration to use. So for each module, you can have a development conf configuration and a distribution configuration. So like if you want it to minify or not, like with uh, less here, it has YUI compress. So uh, again, if you Google Cool Age 86 and Grunt, you can see me just step through the process of creating a Grunt file and, and using plugins and even building a custom plugin. What's Cool Age 86? Cool AJ 86. Yeah, um, not that one. If you search on YouTube, oh, moving to Grunt, there it is. That's the name of my article, and I've got the YouTube video for it. All right, sorry for going over time. Um, hope you enjoyed. Feel free to ask me any questions. I'll hang out here for just a minute.